Well, where's your list of shit? Or are you just gonna fire from the hip as well? We'll fire from the hip. Fine. Yes. Let's make it really informal. Yeah, um, I agree. Like, like we're taking the piss, but I won't take the piss. You know what I'm saying? No. We'll, we'll, we'll just be us. Just you and me, a couple, couple friends. Welcome to the Chunter Basher. Uh, my name is Brian Mulvey. This is Billy Billingham. This is our new podcast. You only recorded six seconds. He had one job. One <laughs> job. The camera, hey, not my fault, the camera's fault. All right, well, at least, hey, you know what? Now we feel more natural. We're in the pocket, we're in the flow. You're f***ed up. Uh, we're, I'm going to do the intro again right now. <sighs> And I've saved the baddest for last, Billy Billingham. Over 20 years as an SAS operator, fighting all over the world. I wanted something different. I wanted to be somebody. It's about going always a little further. You can hardly breathe, your legs are heavy, your arms are heavy. But you can. I never spoke about my military career at all, really, with mom and dad. Then do you regret that? Yeah. I'm not going to have one more drink with him, one more argument with him. Life's not a rehearsal. Dad had a great life. I want a greater life. And you always say to yourself, well, I'll do it next time. Well, there ain't no next time, you've got to do it now. Because time is the one thing you don't know how much you got, and it's priceless. Fight! All right, welcome to the maybe temporary name of the podcast. We don't know officially what it's going to be called, but you say it because you can say it better than me. The podcast is called The Chunter Basher. And what does that mean? Right. A chunter basher is something in the military, particularly from my days in the SAS of being in the jungle, where you'd set up a position, an all-round defense, and then you'd have an area that you'd come together to socialize. But it was really where you'd come to moan about what was going right, what was going wrong. So if you can picture it in the jungle, it's like a tiki hut style thing in the center of your position. You might have a, a long table, um, obviously benches and overhead cover. And at night time, you'd come across there from your, your hammock with your um, candle to provide a bit of light and you'd sit there and just make food together, chat and chunter and moan about what was going right and wrong. Not okay. just moan, but plan as well, you know? I like that. I think that's a good title for a podcast. Yeah. And just to introduce who we are, I think uh, everyone knows who you are. But my name's Brian Mulvey. This is Billy Billingham, for those of you who don't know. Uh, and we became friends about five or six months ago when I moved to the area. Um, I had finished filming a documentary uh, and moved here. And so Billy and I became friends, really kind of got to know each other, just sitting at the bar, having beers together, and would have great conversations and just figured this would be that casual vibe of what we would talk about two guys just sitting at the bar. So we kind of want to get into your past uh, in the military and then your perspective on life, uh, my perspective on life, maybe, and we'll just we'll just have a chat. So yeah, it's let's just get that clear. It's not just about what I think; it's about what we think. It's, yeah, it's it's a shared vision on everything from current affairs to the past to whatever it might be. Yeah. So what's a quick backstory about your background for those of you that for those who are listening that don't know? I uh, grew up in the in UK in the West Midlands. Um, into a family of five, a poor family, mom and dad, two brothers, two sisters. I was a middle child, and being the middle child, and we all know, we're wired different. So straight away from a young age, I started to go rogue, getting a lot of trouble, to the extent I had a cr uh, criminal record at the age of 11 for fighting all sorts of trouble, and then thrown out of school at 13, stabbed at 15, um, got Badly injured in a accident in the workplace at 15, which was illegal, working in a factory, to finding direction through the military, really. But that started even earlier than that, 
where I found boxing at the age of nine, got taught discipline, respect, and what boxing really meant. So that was really the first step on the ladder to sort of keep me out of trouble. Didn't work completely, of course. And then finding the cadets, which is, uh, you know, about military sort of way of life. And that really opened up my eyes to where I wanted to be and gave me direction to go, you know, once I'd finished school, although I finished at 13, of course, and wanted to join the army at 16, but couldn't, but joined at 17. And then having a, a crazy, wild um, career in the airborne division, as you would call it in America, uh, parachute regiment, and then into the special forces, the SES, and then out of that into a crazy world of bodyguarding for A-list celebrities, to going from one side of a camera to appearing on the other side of the camera, and then coming up to date with today of where we are, or where I am anyway, on a TV program, and doing what we do for charity. Yeah, so, and then the TV program, Special Forces, which as we're recording today, comes out in two days Correct. on Monday night. That's the American version, and then there's the British version, which is SAS. Which one does that come out? That comes out on Tuesday night. Oh, so, wow, back to back. Yeah, we've got Monday year, um, Special Forces, World's Toughest Test, Series 2, and then, yeah, Tuesday, um, Series 5 of Celebrity SAS Who Dares Wins in the UK. All right, and I do want to talk about that later. I want to get your perspective on, like, kind of behind the scenes stuff. But going back to the military, yeah. if you didn't join the military at that age, what do you think would have happened with your life? I wouldn't be sat here now. Really? I know that, yeah. I was going totally rogue, getting in a lot of trouble. I'd have probably, at best, probably been in jail. Probably, more likely, probably been killed somewhere. How uh, tough was the training aspect of it when you got in? The military training. To, to get it, to, to, to qualify. To, well, what did you, you started with just the most basic level of the, the military? Or? Well, no, I mean, I joined the infantry, the, the parachute regiment, which is the elite infantry unit. So the, you, the you went elite. straight into that. You knew yeah. you wanted to do something. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that decision came from when I was in the cadets. So I did a number of years in the cadets as a young kid. Mm -hmm. and learning all about, you know, what the military does, learning all the skills, medical, uh, navigation, weapon handling, um, communications, all these skills that made a lot of sense to me. Um, whereas in school, crossing the T's dot meant no, no, I couldn't get that. So I knew where I was going to go. So by the time I was able to join the military, which like I said, I think I might have mentioned earlier, I wanted to join at 16, but I had an injury, so I joined at 17. I then sussed out what department of the military I wanted to be in. And although I was a Marine cadet, I didn't feel that was really for me. So I decided after speaking to friends of mine after the Falklands War in 1982, that the parachute regiment is what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I knew it has a selection process, which most military infantry particularly don't have. So I already knew it was the elite of the infantry units. And without a shadow of a doubt, it is that. So I knew it weren't going to be easy, but I didn't want it to be easy. I wanted to be something special. I wanted to be something different. And I wanted to challenge myself. So I chose the parachute regiment. Did you have the confidence going in that you would make it? I mean, you must have known the numbers of the people that do make it and the people that drop out going in. You probably heard that yeah. beforehand. No, I, I didn't have the confidence, to be honest. I had very little confidence. I'd never been out in my own town of Walsall. And... All of a sudden, you know, I'm, I've joined the military and I was the skinniest, probably the youngest, looking at everybody that was, you know, grown men and thinking I've really stepped out of my comfort zone. I'm really in a place I don't think I'm going to be able to survive. Mm -hmm. But the thing was, as I looked at everybody, I thought, well, I don't want to go back to my lifestyle. I'm going to give it my best shot. They're going to have to throw me out of here. I'm never going to give up. I already said that. I didn't have a lot of confidence. but um, You were willing to die trying. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't go back to what, you know, my old lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Not just that. I wanted something different. I wanted to be somebody. And bearing in mind, I'd already said I'd been in the cadets for six years. And I'd seen all the guys that went before me come back to my hometown, come back to our unit. And just seeing them change into men that I had so much respect for. And they're telling the stories of all the great things they're doing around the globe with the military. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, that's where I need to be. I want to be known for what they're known for, not what I was being known for, for getting in trouble and stuff. So it was, you know, that was a real helping factor, if you like, while I was going through training, while it was so hard not to quit. 
mm-hmm. because I didn't want to go back to it. I wanted to be somebody. And back to the question of confidence. No, I didn't have any great confidence. So, you know, but what gave me confidence was day after day, week after week, watching the number of 70 people that started drop. People were dropping by the wayside every day, every week, and the numbers got smaller. And I was starting to feel confident and grow in myself and start mm-hmm. to believe in myself. And yeah, that's, that's where the confidence came. So 70 people started, how many made it? Seven. Wow. Seven original. You get back squads join you for the passing out parade in certain phases, which I think is the same in American uh, military, but seven of us originals that started. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, and I finished as the champion recruit of that platoon, 497 platoon in 1983. But again, looking at that and building confidence and respect and things you've just touched on, I remember the guy stood in front of me who, you know, I, I absolutely, you know, love for who he was and what he was, was a guy called um, Martin Majerison. He's from Tupara. He'd been to the Falklands, he got wounded, uh, shot in the face, in fact. He still had fresh wounds, stood in front of us. And he was just so humble and so real and so... You know, everybody looking at him just went, wow. I had so much respect for him. And to this day, still do. He was just such a great bloke and such a great instructor and such... And, and again, great lesson learned right from the word go. He was a leader of knowledge and experience. Mm-hmm. Not what he'd heard, not what he'd read, what he'd done. Yeah. And that was... that. And I just thought, that's he's what I want to be. I want to go back to leadership, but I also wanted to ask, with... Uh, this 70 people in the final seven. Do you think if someone was watching from the outside, say it was a show that people got to watch, do you think people would be surprised at the people that made the final seven and surprised at some of the people that dropped out? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know what, Brian, so was I. When you go for a job interview, you know, you naturally do. You look at everybody else and think, wow, he, she looks smarter than me, looks better than me, looks more prepared than me. And it's like a natural thing that people do. Well, you do if you're humble, I guess. And when I went through basic training, every day I looked at everybody else and just kept thinking, they look more mature, they look older, they look stronger, they look better. But like I said, as time went by and people fell by the wayside, I started to grow confidence and believe in myself. And then at the end of it, I think the lesson learned right at the very end was looking around and thinking, and I don't know why we do this, we sometimes think it's about about an image and it's not about an image it's about what is behind the mind behind the heart and soul and what you've got in you and you could be you know the fattest the thinnest the tallest the smallest it doesn't matter it's what's in your heart what's in your belief and what you really want what hunger you have for doing something and that that was a lesson I learned right away because like I say from 70 to 7 and you know I didn't look the best I don't believe I felt inside, still I got a lot to learn, but yeah. So there were a lot of people that you would picture as an SAS soldier in like a movie and stuff that did not make it. And then there's people that you would have never suspected, people that look like they'd be someone in an office job. They are the ones that could make it to become like that final seven level. Yeah, absolutely. And jumping forward into when you just said there, you know, basically in the special forces world, it was exactly that to me. So I guess life is perspectives, right? It's how you've envisaged something, and you all do. You know, you're going to, you're going to you know, you, you, you say, right, there's going to be five SAS guys standing in front of you in about 10 minutes. You have this vision, six foot six, feet shape, whatever it is. And that's what you expect. And then all of a sudden, these people stood in front, and you're like, who are they? What are they? But that is the beauty, again, of the military and the special forces particularly is it's not about an image. It's about what is deep in your soul and behind your mind. And are you the type of person who can do, when you're out of your comfort zone, things that other people can't do? Mm-hmm. Uh, going back to leadership, yeah. you told me an interesting story, and I want you to tell it again for, for the audience. The, the leader that you had who was in charge of your, was it your platoon or your regiment that you never would have suspected was the guy he was? Yeah, I mean, there's a, a lot of those occasions, again, it's, it's never what you expect, but I remember that the, I think the story you talked about is when I, I would only been in the regiment a very short period of time and this old guy walks in and I looked around and I thought, who is this old guy? He's the guy who's going to empty the bins or something. And then somebody tells me, he walks in, he's got a roll-up cigarette and he's, he's smoking. 
He's got a bit of scraggy beard. He looks like Cat Weasel. And I'm thinking, who is that guy? And uh, then somebody says to me, oh, no, that's a Sergeant Major. He's a boss. I was like, what? But then the guy sat down and he was like, he looked around the table. I'm the newest kid there. And he goes, right, we've got this job we've got to do. Planning for it. We've got to move quickly. And he said to me, he looked down the table and he goes, who are you? And I introduced myself. He goes, okay. And then he goes in front of everybody in the, in the squadron at the time. And he went, how are we going to do this job? Straight to me. And I was like, holy shit. How old were you at this point? I was about 23, 24. Mm-hmm. But it's not that. I mean, I'm new to the yeah. SAS and these people have been around a long time and he's asking me. But again, the beauty of that was, and the beauty of the SAS, everybody's involved. Just because you've done X amount of missions and, and operations, it doesn't mean you have all the answers. And that is why I always say the regiment is so successful, is because we always go right from the holders to the news, who's got an idea about it? Because every operation you do, and any military guy will tell you this, there is really no template. Every situation you do, you plan for, you give your orders, your rehearsals, if you've got time, and it always changes. It always, it's always something different will happen. It's always something surreal is going to happen. And in the regiment, like I say, so we throw the pot open to everybody. Everybody puts their little bits in like I did. And then, you know, the boss, as he was, this old guy with the, with the, with the roly and the, the scraggy beard, takes over and goes, right, okay, bang, this, this. And it's what, like watching a jigsaw being put together. All these guys will be going, right, you know, fuel, helicopters, weaponry, political status. It's all being put together and you're just watching this and you think, wow. And I, I remember it again at that key point looking and going, wow, that's leadership right there. He doesn't have to stand up and tell me he's the boss. We now get it, he is the boss. But what he is good at as well is utilizing strengths and weaknesses around that table. To be a leader and be a good leader, you've got to have a team. Yeah. And to have a good team. And that was a great lesson right from the word go. Not about image. It was all about knowledge and experience. And Mm -hmm. there ain't no substitute for that. But when it comes down to carrying out a mission, like you're on an operative mission, yeah. the discussion as a team probably goes out the window, and the leader's got to make fast decisions based on all of the plan going in, or is there room during a mission to say, what do you think we do here? What do you think we do here? Is it just follow well, what I'm saying and go? I think with any mission, that the one critical ingredient that we all want more of and you'll never get is time. So everything's about time. So again, no two situations will ever be the same. So, but, so the plan will all get put together. We'll off you go onto the ground. And there's another thing about leadership. In your team, everybody's a leader. Every single person in your team is a leader. And what I mean by that is, for example, if you're going to go, you know, we're traveling from A to B, let's just say that's by helicopter. So the helicopter pilot's the leader to start that mission. Once he's got us to the point and dropped us off, hopefully in the right place, not always, you get off, then the guy I've put in the front of the patrol, the lead scout, he's now the leader because he's got to get there. And the beauty of the way I operated and the way, as you know, I was taught from the very early days from the guy I spoke about, the mm-hmm. Martin, Martin Majerison, when you've been given a job to do, let him do it. He never got, you know, you don't lean over the shoulder and, and micromanage. Allow the persons to do the job. So that's what I'm saying. So the lead scout now is the leader. I'd let him go. He knows what he's doing, he's na- navigating, he's check navigating, he's doing all that. Of course, I'll oversee it, because when you need to be a leader, if the train starts to lose a wheel, my job is to put that wheel back on and keep mm-hmm. it going forward. So, yeah, so each person in that patrol is a leader or in that group. When you get to the, to the location, the explosive guy takes over. He's in charge. I'm just sat back with everybody else waiting to go and do our bit. When you get into the building, when you, or whatever it might be, then... And then when it comes to wrapping it all up, then that's when I step up, or whoever the leader is, in this case it was me, I step up and take control of the rest of it to, to polish it and finish it all off. Or as a leader, this is where you earn your money, when things start to go a little bit wayward and go off track, you're there then to earn your money and go bang, stop, rebalance, regroup, recheck, go again. And that, again, in a nutshell, that's leadership. And that was leadership I'd learned from the start all the way through. And that was the type of leader I'd believe I would. And the other thing about leadership is, you know and I know, you know, in a, particularly in like the commercial world, people will choose friends over people with the experience and the knowledge. Yeah. And that's crazy. That's wrong. And, it, it's, and it's, you know, it's, it's doomed for failure at some point. In the regiment, 
learn from the military at Paget Rangers and the, the SAS, not everybody's suited to every job and every mm -hmm. operation is different. So to be left out ain't a nice feeling, but you've got to accept, hang on a minute, I ain't the sort of person who wants to sit there for 12 hours and watch somebody. I'm probably the person who wants to come through the window and, and do the last bit. So you, you've got to be prepared to be left out. And as a leader, you've got to be prepared to tell, tell you you're not on this operation and not worry about, oh, we're going to lose a bit of friendship or you're going to get a bit pissed off with me. That's the way it is. Yeah. So it's about being a good leader is choosing the right people with the right cred uh, credentials who can do the job, not people that you like. Well, and the, the stakes are too high, especially in what you do. Well, I mean, ultimately in what you do versus other things because you're talking about if you choose the wrong person, yeah. you're putting everyone's life at stake. Yeah, that's true, but I mean... I mean, I, of course it relates to everything else, but ultimately where you are, that's where... It, the stakes yeah. are the most because yeah. you, you're you're dealing with people's lives. Yeah, you know you're gonna fail the mission, probably get yourself killed, get somebody else killed, get a lot more people killed. And also, what we never talk about is indirectly that task you're going in generally is to, you know, change a course or direction for whatever for you know away from evil to save hundreds of thousands of lives indirectly by screwing that up. That's what you've just done. You've just allowed a lot of people to suffer or die. My question, I want to kind of transition to fear. Yeah. What, like with, with joining the cadets and then going into the SAS training, what was the first moment where it became real and you were actually on a mission? I'll, t I'll tell you where it became real. was um, finishing training, going to Belize. You know, there was a lot of things there. When you talk about fear, it, it, it was fear. It was being worried. It was going to, I'm joining a bunch of people I don't really know. They'd all just come back from the Falklands War, so they've all been tested and been, been to war. And prior to going out there, um, finished training, and then went up to the battalion, it was already deployed. So they have a, what they call a rear guard, protecting the barracks. A small number of people that are leaving the army or for whatever reason don't go on the, op, on the tour, whatever it might be. And I met a guy there called Benny, Benny Bentel. Fucking huge guy, lovely blob, been to the Falklands, all that sort of stuff. And he was on the rear guard. He was the commander of the rear guard because he was leaving the military. However, he was going to come out to Belize after a month or so just to finish off the tour and uh, join us, then leave, make a little bit more money and leave. And that was the idea. And so I met, we met Benny. Bear in mind, we've just gone through six months of screaming, being screamed at, shouted at, you know, fucking really push through your paces. Now... You're entering this real world. I meet this guy, Benny, who's been through exactly what I have, but been to war. And he sat us down and spoke to us. And it was the first time we've really been sat down and spoke to properly and kindly, if you like. And, and listening to Benny and his experiences and all the stuff, real nice guy. And he said, right, these are the things you need to be looking out for. You know, keep your mouth shut, work hard, learn. Don't think you ever know all the answers. Listen to the people that don't shout about how good they are, but will show you the way. All mm -hmm. these great lessons. So I then go to Belize. I'm in Belize. I've been in Belize about two months, and you know I'm carrying live rounds at the back of a patrol of experienced guys. And if someone goes down in the jungle, which is you can't see more than frigging two meters in front of you anyway, I've got to be able to react and and, and deal with it. So that was in your mind. You know, I've literally got live rounds pointing in the back of everybody and all that sort of stuff. And I think yeah, as a young kid, everybody does. But then, after about a month or so being in Belize, we were in the actual, out of the jungle and in the, in the base camp, which is um, airport camp. And the alarms went off one day and I wasn't sure what, what was going on. All these alarms going off at the camp and everybody's running down to the foot soccer pitch. So I go down there and I'm looking and all of a sudden this helicopter comes in, lands and the medics run out and they pull a body, one of our guys off the helicopter who's just been shot and killed. And I'm watching it thinking, fucking hell, this is real. This is what, this is really the world I'm in now. We that was the about first it. moment you felt that. That was a real moment. And, and, but what made it worse, as they came off, the blanket fell from his face and it was Benny. Oh, shit. And I was like, fucking hell. It was a horrible wake up moment of, oh my God. Cause that was someone you looked up to and, and yeah. someone you cared about. Yeah. You know, although I'm now not in combat, but I now realize this is where I'm going with this. This is, and this was during training. So he'd taken three rounds or something and unfortunately died. And it was really sad. And he was fucking such a great guy and nice person. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, war is indiscriminate in terms of who's going to get out of it, get out of it in one piece. 
And that was pretty, from that moment onwards, I realised. And then going forward after that, we then go to Cyprus some years later. And Cyprus was supposed to be a sunshine tour. You know, a relaxing tour. Although it was six months divided into two groups of three. Three months in the south of the island where you're just doing training and all this sort of stuff and getting yourself fit and preparing and working in these environments. Second part, you go up north onto what they call the buffer zone. Mm -hmm. And the buffer zone is... Because, you know, I don't know if you know, Cyprus is divided into p two pieces. There's, there's the Turkish half and there's a, the, the Greek Cypriot half. You know, from when they invaded, the Turks invaded in 1974, I think it was, and took over half the island. So there's still, a, a, a you know, an hostile feeling across that border. And there's a belt right across the centre. And that belt really is like the width of three roads all across, which is no man's land. Mm -hmm. So on the far, on the north side are all the Turks, all their military. On the south are the Greeks, but it's it's controlled by the United Nations. So it was a United Nations tour, and this was supposed to be, like I say, a jolly, nice time. But we'd landed in Cyprus. We'd only been there about two days, and a terrorist group called the Palestinian Liberation Organization (PLO) decided to go wild. They attack the the air airfield where we, you know, down the road from where we are, with RPG sevens and gunfire you know, killing a few people. They killed a few military guys on the roads going up to, um, uh, up to sort of the north. The, uh, so there's all these little terrorist attacks going on. People have been kidnapped and so it, it all went wild. So then I've now done three or four years in the military. I've now, I'm actually now in charge of four people. So again, that was a lot of pressure on me. Although I thrived in it, I didn't feel fear as such, but I knew if something goes down, there's a chance we're going to be killing people or somebody else is going to get killed. So that was always in your mind. And I wouldn't say I got excited by it, but I certainly didn't get, I wasn't fearing it. I wasn't worrying about it. You know, mm -hmm. from the lessons learned right at the start of seeing Benny die and realizing this could end any time. And, but I, I kind of, like all military people do, you accept it and you get on with the job in hand. And then actually getting close to being shot and blown up is we then went onto a tour in Northern Ireland. And on that very trip, I think we had about six of our guys killed. Wow. You know, blown to pieces and shot. And we had one run over by Joy Riders. So there was a lot of threats there. And that was really the first real bit of combat that I'd got involved in. And again, it was, it was kind of... I'd be wrong to say I wasn't worried. I was worried. I wasn't living in fear or scared of it. You know, I just accepted it and just thought... Kind of rate, wanted to rise to the challenge to see how... I cope with this stuff. And it, and, and it went from there. And then I ended up, you know, joining the SES. And then in Bosnia, Jesus, Bosnia, I think we got blown up. We got mortared. We got shot at. This was regular. We're in the middle of a minefield. We're in a combination of all of it. And it was just accepted. It's every day yeah. going on. And, and Bosnia was just bodies everywhere, killing everywhere. You know, it, it was mental. Not by us, by, by the the situation in Bosnia, but we were in amongst it. You know, you're a target just like everybody else. And then really sort of my close combat and getting in amongst it was really, you know, the the Middle East stuff, Afghanistan and all that sort of stuff, where it really got sort of close and, and directed at me. Where I, again, every soldier wants to know, how would I react? And I, I, I honestly, I felt I thrived in it. I, it was, I am very much a crisis managing person and I just f think I'm a fit and I don't think about too much of the worry and what might go wrong. I ain't got time for that. I think about how we're going to get this job done and then in the cold light of day like we're talking now and I'm going to be and there's, as we're talking, there's little things flashing through my mind going, you know, there's an element of luck in everything we do in the military world and of course I'd like to say it was all a professional and all skillful to get in and out of what we did and got away with but there's an element of luck and I think I had a lot of luck. Mm -hmm. like a lot of people you know but back to the question of fear without sound ridiculous I, I didn't really ever have any real fear problems or attacks it, it was always a good balance for me it was mm -hmm. always a personal risk assessment it reminded me the danger was there so I didn't get too complacent and too humble but then I was then able to lock it away store it get on with it come back, finish the job, and then, then you talk about it. Go, how, did you, how did we just walk out of that? Yeah. You know, from having bullets literally go f right under your chin through your weapon, 
being blown up and just getting up covered in dust and shit going, how did I get away with that? And there's, you know, shrapnel all around me, but it, it didn't touch me. Yeah. And luck, I suppose. So, yeah. Uh, so your show, Special Forces, you filmed in New Zealand and it was yeah. winter there, summer here while mm -hmm. you're filming. So it's winter, it's cold. The last season was in the Jordanian desert. Yeah. How hot was it in the first season in that in the desert, would you say? Oh, mate, it was... I mean, I'm talking degrees, over 100 degrees. Really? Yeah, in the daytime. Nighttime, it drops down to about 80. The thing with it as well is the humidity. Mm -hmm. You know, in the daylight, you've got direct sunlight. You're trying to survive that in the in the evenings, and they're living in a tent. And we were living in tents as well. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, we were li living in a building, but there was no like. You weren't in some resort uh, at no, the end mate. of each day, uh, five. Living star. on a camp cot like everybody else. I mean, it, it's extreme, you know. Mm -hmm. And then now, like you just said, this one is in New Zealand, and it was minus four on the base camp, by the way. Which, t to you, which one was more difficult? I I prefer the cold. Yeah. The reason being is you got to get pushed around. You got to get motivated. It keeps you warm. You want to get motivated. In the heat, you know, it's direct sunlight. It exhausts you. Yeah. yeah, it does. And direct sun, you lose it. Not that I've ever experienced it. You've been on a sunbed before, though, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 of course. <laughs> <laughs> Is that your desert train? Well, I mean, when I go for a walk outside, I would say, you know, when it's hot out, that's similar challenges, right? Yeah, no. <laughs> okay, all right, well. Yeah, so, you know, every environment's got its challenges, and everybody's, you know... Horses for courses. Some people like the hot, some people like the cold. But even if you like the hot or you like the cold, it's just what you're doing there is just something you're not going to be used to. It's, it's horrendous. I think, you know, when I watched the first season, yeah. you know, each episode's what, a half hour, an hour? It's 40 okay. minutes. Okay. So, uh, so, like an hour with the commercials and stuff. What people probably don't realize is they are working how many hours a day doing these? 18, 18 hours yeah, a day. At least 18 hours a day. So it's not just like, all right, we're, we're going to get six hours worth of no. stuff today for footage and then just hang out the rest of the day. No. It's that, 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 you're right. You just nailed it there, mate, because people look at it and go, oh, well, I could do that. That's not so bad. But what you got to remember, on top of all those challenges, exercises that you see, that's the exciting bits or part of it. There's that much goes on. The artist thing must be editing. He's deciding what you want to use because so much goes on. Like I say, as you just alluded to, over an 18-hour period. Mm -hmm. sometimes more than that and you've then on top of that you've got the deprivation you know they're not getting the food calories and intake that they normally get mm -hmm. that you know they're sleeping if they're getting any sleep at all on a camp cot which is you know not again good at the best of times so they're deprived of sleep deprived of the food deprived of water and you know the, the, their bodies are getting tired and by the hour, not by the day. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot that goes on that the camera doesn't show. You know, it doesn't really show the elements, as in the weather. It yeah. is cold. It's freezing. You know, it's fucking, like I say, in New Zealand, it was minus four on the base camp, and then they're going into the water. Mm -hmm. Most challenges we did were into ice cold water. I mean, it's hard enough just to get through normal life when you're not sleeping well and you're not yeah. eating well, when you're having to be in a desert or be in the cold elements yeah. plus having to do military drills difficult military drills testing endurance i mean now i get it because i you know me sitting on my couch watching the first he's like you pathetic loser you drop out this quickly <laughs> i mean i i don't know how long i'd be able to last i'm like judging kate goslin on the yeah. first season she, she how long did she run in that first like she did a few days i think but which you gotta remember i mean she's had eight kids is it or yeah it um, I don't know how much training she did before, mm -hmm. but you know. But like that first like run with all your gear on, yeah. which is how many pounds on average? It's, it's thirty kit. It's about fifty-five, sixty pounds with all your water, all your food, and all the kit. Yeah. And so, and they have to run how many miles? That like? depends. It can be anything from two k's to ten k's. Yeah. To more, we've done more in the past, you know, mm -hmm. so it did, because it. Part of the challenge to get to the challenge is those marches, you know, speed marches too. And they expect the male, female, it doesn't matter, you know, what what size, shape you are. You've all got to carry exactly the same. Mm -hmm. There's no um, let up for anybody. Everybody's got to do exactly the same. Now, you don't expect the small frame lady or the older person to be up the front with the sprinters and the big athletes. Mm -hmm. But you still expect them to keep going. You know, yeah. their 100% is 
quarter of the speed of the big doesn't matter you know th that's the way it is so yeah everybody there's no concessions is what i'm saying for anybody i think it's a testament to what you said earlier about like yeah. the people who made the final seven out of the 70 people in the the paratrooper regiment uh last season of the show yeah it was a former bachelor bachelorette hannah and you have all these athletes like Danny Amendola. You have other yeah. Olympic athletes where you think it takes an athlete to get to the end of something like that. Yeah. You wouldn't expect it to be bachelorette. No, you wouldn't. You, but again, remember, it's not... People... Oh, I don't know why. Whenever people see anything physical, they all, they all think of Spartan Challenge or Great Mud Runner or whatever you want to call it. It's nothing like that. This is a combination of physical and mental and emotional barriers being broken down mm -hmm. all in a one -er. there's no sports or you know outdoor activity that does that the military does so it's all that like combined together that's why you know no disrespect to the athletes or, and the soccer players the football players or whatever you are it's about your mindset and your resilience you got to remember these athletes are amazing athletes mm -hmm. but it's one dimensional you know you're trained to be on a track and sprint 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 yeah eating the right food getting the right sleep in the right conditions now all of a sudden you're out of all of your comfort zones. Everything is discomfortable. You don't really have any sort of um, say in what we're going to do. You're going to do it when we tell you to do it. So all that's playing on your mind. Deprivation, food, sleep, rest, all that sort of stuff. And cold, wet, and, and doing stuff that a bit of it you might have done before, but then everything around it, you've got to now throw into that pot. So it just shows, which is, when people talk about well, what's the relevance to the special forces in this show that you do? The relevance is the ethos. You know, firstly, the locations we go. We go, as you've alluded to, we do the desert. We do the, the snow and ice. We do, you know, European-type planes. We use every environment, mm -hmm. just like the regiment does, because that, that will tell you a lot about people. Secondly, it's about the character, the person, you know, how they're going to react with all these deprived of sleep, deprived of food, pushed to the limits. Because that's what the regiment's about. It's not, we're not looking for a super fit, the fittest, the hardest, the whatever, the fastest. We're looking for you as an individual. And that's what the show does. So they're the relevances to the SES or the special forces. You know, the character of the person. Because mm -hmm. that's what you're looking for in special forces. The, operating in a different environment. Being in, out of your comfort zone and getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. And then finding a way, thinking outside the box and not giving up. You don't have to be a professional boxer, a sprinter, an NFL player to have all those ingredients. A bachelorette's done it. Yeah. It's about the individual. It's about that character. And you don't know what that character's got. And they don't know what they've got until they peel back. And how and they perform under pressure. Yeah. Putting pressure situations. I know you kind of laugh and go, yeah, I'll sit on the sofa and, and go, <laughs> blah, blah. But you, you, yeah. you probably do better than you think. If that is in, if that is in gear, you, you'd be surprised. Because mm -hmm. like I say... What other people, what people don't realise about the show is this as well. It's very much an individual journey. If you were part of that group there, we're not looking at you like we'd be looking at Dwight Howard. You know, we're expecting Dwight Howard to be sprinting way above what you're doing. Mm -hmm. We'll push him beyond what he's done. So there's his 100% test. Your test is to keep along the same journey and go to your limit. Do you understand yeah, what I'm I saying? Understand. So yeah. it, it's very much an individual thing. And, and there's no shame in leaving early you know it's great everybody wants to get to the end of course you do it's no part, it's no big deal if you don't because you've gone i don't care who you are we will push you through a barrier that you've never been through and you will leave you know amazing yourself that wow i did that how did i get that? but you've done it because yeah. you can do it and you you leave a better version of who you are and it's, it's surprising the number of things people the contestants if you like get from it as firstly their camaraderie just like the military very much like the military those people on that show will become friends forever now they really will and they'll pick up you know where they left off in the desert three years ago four years ago whatever it is they'll have a laugh and a joke they'll remember things and and they've got a common bond they're all in this boat being pushed to their limits and they'll never forget that that's exactly like the military as well you know and the other thing that they learn from it there's many things, but the other thing that is very clear is they will learn what's important to them. Yeah. And it ain't status, it ain't materials, it's actually your health, your friends, mm -hmm. your loved ones, and simplicity. 
Do you yeah. know what I mean? And also knowing that you can't control what you can't control. So just accept it, feel the darkness, and push through it. And you really get to walk away with all those skills. One thing that I really was like an aha moment for me in the first season was your confrontation with Danny Amendola. Yeah. And then uh, I think uh, Foxy said, like, there is no place for you to talk back or you to get into an argument or, or be, mm. you know, arrogant or selfish or whatever in a battle because you you could get people killed if you don't follow direct yeah. orders. And then they were all having this conflict in the tent afterwards. That's and funny. this is from season one, so it's not like a spoiler. If, I mean, yeah. yeah. For, but what um, I think Mike Piazza and then even uh, Rudy was saying, they're breaking us down into nothing. I think he even said break us down into pieces of shit. Yeah. And then they're taking our brain out and putting in special ops material. How? What do you have to say about that? <laughs> I mean, that that was a bit of a wild statement taking out our brains. Listen, okay. the, the military are thinking people. Yeah, you follow orders, but you, you follow orders, but you, you're also allowed to think about what you're doing and have an opinion and a say about what you're doing. You know, so the thing about it is, you can't explain on a course like that, why things are happening. And what really gets to the bottom of people is sitting around and waiting, not knowing the answer to everything, not being able to do what they want when they want. Mm -hmm. That's the military style. That's what we're putting you through. That shows your real test of character. Yeah. And that's what, you know, led to that sort of argument and that downfall with Danny. Mm -hmm. um, but you've got to remember, it's all based on experience. Mm -hmm. On an SAS operations, I've sat there for days, weeks, months for what we call one minute of glory, for the target to appear in that one minute bracket for it to happen. We've sat there, you know, in boiling heat, freezing cold, waiting for that moment. And that's when there's discipline and respect. The discipline to stay focused, wait your moment, because when that moment comes and then be able to spark at 100%, full on and make that happen. So you're pushing all that into a 10, 12 day course for these people. And of course, they've never been put in a position like that. They're used to having things when they want it. You know, an Amazon moment. Mm -hmm. I want it now and I want it here, now. And they get it. And then all of a sudden you're into the military world, which is hurry up and wait, stay focused, stay ready, stay alert. And that's hard when, you know, you're not able to train properly, you're not able to eat properly, but that's what you have to do. So all that is combined based on all our experience, but we haven't got time to sit them down and explain that. We tell them at the start, you know, everything is done for a purpose, everything is done for a reason, and it is. That's not just words, that's actually it. It's the way it is. The sitting around and waiting, the riding in an uncomfortable vehicle is all part of it because it riles people up. It shows their character. Can't get, goes straight back to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yeah. And that's everything from traveling, what you're wearing, what you're eating, how you're acting, how you're being spoke to. That's what it is. You've come for that experience because that experience will peel you back to your raw self and let you learn a, a lot about yourself. And I think if you asked everybody who's been on the show, regardless of, of where they got to, their experience, it's unique to everybody, but they'll all say they really got a lot from it. Yeah. And I have not heard one person on every one of the shows I've done in UK, Australia, or US, have said they've had a bad experience. They might not have come across as, the, we all want to come across as an hero, and whoa, 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 but... There's reality. That's what you come to see. That's who you are. And you know what? Go back and build on it. And they do. How many years have you been retired from the SAS? Not um, trying to age you here. I'm sorry, but. <laughs> Good question, mate. I actually, I always count 27 years of service, but then I stayed on what they called um, I readiness reserves. We mm -hmm. call it back in the, it was LDET. So officially, I joined the army in 1983. And I left, my official leaving date was 2005, December 2015. So how much, so being so back. So that's over 30 odd years, 34, yeah. five years. So being, doing the show again, SAS and yeah. Special Forces, how much joy did the show bring you being able to go back and yeah. do that type of stuff again? Like how much do you enjoy it? I love it, mate. As I've, I've said to you many times over a beer, it's, the, the beauty of the show is there's no script. It's not like anything else on TV. There's no script, there's no rehearsals, there's no retakes. It's a course. 
we run a course with a lot of cameras thrown in our face, 24 a day, and you just get used to it. You, it's, they're never there now. You're like, don't mm-hmm. care. So we'll say what we say based on what we see and how we feel and, and what, what is happening. And then it's just recorded and edited later on. The beauty of it, what I love about it is, it's like being back in the military again, but getting paid better. You know, yeah, it really is. It's it's, and it's not superstar wages. It's not about that, but it's about having that camaraderie again. As I talk, th- these people who've done the show walk away with that camaraderie. So for four of us to come back together, yeah, and do what we know best, based on a lot of experience now, and, and enjoy it. And it's hard work. It's hard work for us. You got to remember, I'm still running with 22 year olds, athletes. I'm still, and, and so are the other guys. You know, so we have to stay on top of our game. Of course, I'm not as fit as everybody else, but I'm still be able to do what, I don't ask anybody to do anything I would, I can't do. That's a fact, mm-hmm. you know, but again, coming together as a, it's like being back in the military. We have such banter. I wish they'd do something off, off. Uh, I would love to see your guys' time. Oh, mate. You'd I don't know that. why they don't show that. Honest to God, you would love it. Some of it's dark. Military humor's dark. Oh yeah. I mean, I know your humor. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, you know what I'm talking about. So imagine that times four. Yeah. And, and the beauty of it, again, you've got American sense of humor, British sense of humor. And the military humor is very, very much the same. It's just the, the, the throwaway lines. And it's, it's hilarious. Yeah. You know, if, if you could do a little thing behind the scenes, it, it would be hilarious. It would have to be X-rated, but it'd be funny. I will say you uh, are very good. You have very quick comebacks. I mean, I always thought I was witty. I, you're a match for me. And I, I think you have <laughs> decades of training of being, because I'll throw like an insult your way, and then you'll come back with something 10 times funny and 10 times worse, and I'm just like, I'm Mate, like that's, stunt. That's based on experience, and I think most of it's been thrown at me over 30 odd years. Yeah, you know I'm a little mate? jealous of it. Yeah. Nah. But I'll, I that's, hit you with some good singers every once in a while. Yeah, you've, you've caught me with the odd left duck. <laughs> and, and, may, and that's what future episodes of this podcast will be yeah. is uh, once we kind of get into the rhythm, we'll start insulting each other more. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Stop. <All right. laughs> there can be only one. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, should we wrap that up and have that be our first uh, episode of uh, the Chunter Basher? Yeah. So. It, as I say, it's a shared experience, and we know by no means have the answers to everyone's problems. But mm-hmm. what we have is experience, and uh, you know, true stories of places and things that we've done. So we yeah. hope you enjoy it. All right, perfect. Well, cheers, man. It's been good.